freedom wherever there's trouble over land and sea and air. G.I. Joe is there. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the next installment in my American Foreign Policy Lecture Series. Today, I want to talk about something stemming from an earlier lecture I gave on constructivism in my IR series, and one that I think really gets to the heart of how the United States functions on the international stage. Now, for those who remember the constructivism lecture, constructivism is a way in understanding how, and more importantly, why, states act the way they do by understanding how they see the world, right? how they see other states, how they see themselves, and how they see certain regions. So for example, the United States sees the world and each country differently. So you know, more than just simply other states existing in the international system, we see a country like Canada as neighborly, friendly, and cooperative. We see Great Britain as a key strategic partner and ally in global affairs. We see China as competitive yet still workable within our international economic network. We see Russia, on the other hand, as an untrustworthy competitor in Europe, the Middle East, and parts of the former Soviet Union. Even worse, we see Iran as belligerent, hostile, and the primary threat to our interests and allies in the Middle East. And at the same time, we see a country like Saudi Arabia as one of those allies, even though Saudi Arabia is more authoritarian than Iran and has much deeper ties to a network of global terrorist organizations we're directly fighting. We see North Korea in pretty much the same light as we see Iran, but only in the East Asian theater. And we see South Korea as a strategic military partner in containing the threats coming from Pyongyang. We see Venezuela, you know, particularly under the Trump administration, as the epitome of a socialist hellhole, <laughs> uh, you know, with a government condemned for starving its own people and turning a once wealthy country into an impoverished third world backwater. Of course, you know, we're not really concerned for the well-being of the Venezuelan people, but we use concerns for their lack of political rights and civil liberties as a way of engaging a country we want to believe is socialist, that holds a vast amount of oil reserves that, well, prior to Hugo Chavez coming to power in 1998, were part of our overseas markets. And on a completely different level, you know, we see a small peripheral state like Uruguay as, well, just Uruguay. You know, the country might actually be more socialist in practice and ideology than Venezuela, but that's inconsequential to American international interests. So it just exists without any real identities or affixed adjectives. So what all this means is that an understanding of constructivism places heavy emphasis on perceptions, identity, and narrative of states. You know, more and more I'm becoming a fan of the constructivist approach to IR theory because it's really the best way in explaining and understanding why states act certain ways towards some countries and other ways towards others. You know, more importantly, it helps explain why a state like the U.S. can justify going to war with one country over some alleged human rights violation while looking the other way completely when another country commits even worse crimes against humanity because that country is our ally and our friend. You know, even if that country is, you know, realistically speaking, more dangerous and threatening to its neighbors. So this selective ad hoc approach to foreign policy that seems paradoxical and you know, more than a little hypocritical has a logic to the seeming illogicality and is something I euphemistically call Wilsonian realism, which in my opinion is I think the best way to describe the nature, orientation, and scope of American foreign policy since perhaps the 1960s, but certainly since the 1990s. Now, at first glance, the term seems illogical since Wilsonianism, which is a branch of the school of liberalism, stands diametrically opposed to the philosophies of realism. You know, the former calls for deliberate and proactive global engagement, while the latter serves as more than self-help defensive diplomacy. But because constructivism explains how states view the world in relation to itself, it makes it easier to understand how realism and liberalism can actually be hybridized 
into a kind of engage-as-you-go foreign policy indicative of the United States and really any other great power. Of course, this also identifies the risk uh, you know, a state can have if it is seen by a country like the U.S. as threatening, belligerent, or aggressive, because it suddenly makes them a target for freedom, liberation, and of course even regime change. Um, especially if that country upholds, you know, principles of universal rights and laws. Now, so in many ways, Wilsonian realism helps us understand why we apparently give a damn about something happening in one part of the world while giving little to no notice of the same thing happening in another. No. So why, for instance, does the United States care about alleged human rights violations happening in Venezuela, but not Myanmar? You know, why does the United States intervene to topple a despotic government in Iraq, but leave Saudi Arabia alone? Why does the United States push for democratic elections in Egypt or the Palestinian territories and then condemn the results if the wrong party gets elected? You know, look, it's no secret that the United States selectively spreads the gospel of democracy where and when it's, you know, it is of strategic interest. So you know, not only is Wilsonian realism the best way to describe American foreign policy, but it also serves as one of the most aggressively coercive forms of foreign policy. If Wilsonianism, drawn from larger principles of liberalism, compels practicing states to engage the world for the greater moral good and targets countries and governments that violate universal laws of human rights, then it serves as, you know, the casus belli for self-help realism since the state inserts itself into a conflict through some moral justification it can ultimately capitalize on. You know, put another way, Wilsonian realism allows a country like the U.S. to rhetorically use policies of liberalism to further realist goals of power and security. Now, l let me repeat that again, because this is, I think, the crux of the entire argument here. Wilsonian realism allows a country like the U.S. to rhetorically use politics of liberalism as a way of furthering realist goals of power and security, right? It offers promises of long-term stability and prosperity to a country in exchange for short-term dependence and reliance on U.S. political, economic, and military hegemony, right? It's, it's, it's a type of coercive diplomacy that ultimately gets another state to do what you want, either through lofty adherences to, you know, liberté, equalité, fraternité, or simply with promises of access to American goods and services. You know, so in short, we're either going to give you democracy or we're going to give you a McDonald's. Uh, but either way, you're going to love our intervention. Congratulations. You are being rescued. Please do not resist. Thus, my discussion of Wilsonian realism isn't so much being critical of U.S. foreign policy as it's trying to make it out for what it really is and what it really does. You know, so it's no secret the United States selectively spreads the gospel of democracy where and when it's of strategic interest. And I'd even go so far as to say that putting elements of liberalism into practice actually makes a state more belligerent and aggressive than true classical realism does because it gives the state an ethos, right, um, a purpose to engage the world and shape it towards a vision it considers optimal for global cooperation and security. And in the process, views any opposing state as an obstacle and competitor to that envisioned end. Right? So thus, Wilsonian realism doesn't seem that paradoxical at all, but in order to wrap our heads around it, right, we first need to identify what the basic principles of realism are, what the basic elements of liberalism embody, and how constructivism allows us to fuse elements of the two together into one amalgamated hybrid. Right? So once we get this, we can then tackle the following questions. Is the pursuit and defense of liberalist principles around the world a more belligerent foreign policy than realism? You know, and by extension, 
do states driven by principles of universal human rights and self-determination increase the likelihood of coercive diplomacy and increase the antagonism towards states that deny one, the other, or both? Number two, can liberalism be structured within a realist mindset of self-interest and a pursuit of power and security? Right? In other words, does liberalism need to be enforced in order to work? And by enforce, does liberalism need some pre-existing overt security apparatus in order to implement these ideas? Right? You know, because sort of by themselves, ideas just remain ideas. How do we implement ideas? Number three. Is Wilsonian realism a natural policy of a hegemonic power operating within principles of democratic peace theory and commercial pacifism? You know, these two things, dem peace theory and commercial pacifism, are really the two primary operating elements that make liberalism an internationally engaging philosophy. So with that in mind, can forms of cooperation and inclusiveness only work after a hegemonic state asserts domination and assures stability and security. In other words, in order for collective cooperation to happen, do we need a hegemonic power to act as leader, right, as guide, as some coercive authority to get other states to cooperate? So let's get started with a refresher on the main theories of IR. And, you know, if you want a more in-depth look at them, you know, I welcome you to check out my full-length feature videos. And if you just want to skip ahead to the more juicy stuff, then click the timestamp links below. So we first begin with a review of the basic principles of the School of Realism, which has predominated IR studies for centuries and, you know, really forms the foundation of any understanding of foreign policy. So first and foremost, realism identifies the state as the primary actor in the international arena. Even more recent studies of realism that take, you know, international organizations and other non-state actors into account still subordinate all of them to the state, which, in the absence of any world-governing body, which we will never get in our lifetime, represents the pinnacle of authority. So, and because there are dozens and dozens of other states in the world, you know, they all compete with each other for advantage and influence, which forces each of them in turn to be in constant pursuit of power and security, right? Power and security. This is the fundamental 101 IR theory thing and one on which, you know, everything else rests. Now, the pursuit of power and security reflects states operating in a world of anarchy, which implies the lack of a global sovereign authority, as I just mentioned, and also that they are operating within a world of uncertainty and incomplete information. This forces states to err on the side of caution in all matters, you know, lest they expose a weakness that others can exploit and undermine. And this adherence to both prudence and preservation makes the possibility of war really impossible to rule out and completely dangerous to overlook. So while war is never openly wanted, states should always prepare for one, or at the absolute least, be able to defend itself from one, right? Never um, underestimate the possibility of a war breaking out. Never underestimate the probability of you getting sucked into one. Now, this requires smaller and weaker states to ally with others in some type of collective defense against a perceived larger aggressor. So this you know, balance of power, as we call it within the discipline, um, is a natural phenomenon as it is something based out of self-interest, right? the self-interest of preservation. So that means that states are going to ally with others not out of any altruism or genuine trust, but rather out of mutual and, I should emphasize, temporary need for collective defense around some common threat. So this cost-benefit analysis is also a critical element in the heart of any state decision, though it sort of implies at times that states can ally or bandwagon with the aggressive power if it means a greater guarantee to their security and power. So, you know, in other words, if a state can get more out of security by allying against a power, it's going to do so. But if it feels that it can bandwagon with that power, 
and increase its security, then it's going to do so you know, as well. Now, in smaller and rarer cases, and you know, here Realism acknowledges this, but they don't really recommend it. Realism notes the benefit of preemptive war as a means of denying advantage to a potential rival. But for all its acknowledgement of war as politics by other means, realism understands wars to be nasty, brutish, costly, and ultimately unavoidable. So therefore, a key element to a theory largely defensive in nature is to use war strategically for one's benefit and gain if an advantage presents itself. Now, this state of nature is state of war understanding of the world is countered by the more optimistic theory of liberalism, where the primary point is that human progress and learning can make the world a more peaceful place to live. And unlike the seemingly endless cycle of uncertainty, mistrust, and predatory nature that realism understands the world to be, liberalism holds that states can be joined in common pursuit of peace, freedom, and prosperity. In fact, the state of anarchy would make such common purpose obvious in that cooperation fosters mutual benefit and deepens interdependency. Now, you add to this the relatively new phenomenon of international institutions like the League of Nations or the United Nations, and, you know, when I say new, remember, new actually is 100 years old here, and suddenly states find themselves united in some common purpose, in some common goals and objectives. And this gives us two critically important developments over the past two centuries. The concepts of commercial pacifism and democratic peace theory, which I you know, just mentioned a couple of minutes ago. Commercial pacifism argues that no states that are economically trading with each other will go to war. While democratic peace theory takes it one step further and argues that no two democracies will go to war with each other. So, you know, while both of these are overly simplistic arguments given here, um, you know, and they all involve a lot more understanding, they nevertheless show how liberalism seeks lasting peace, where realism only seeks stability in the status quo. So this places liberalism in a much more prominent position for developed states, since, you know, they're much more likely to seek long-lasting alliances and partnerships with neighbors based on similar ideologies. So whereas realism, especially classical realism, warns against bringing in ideology to international relations because ideology risks dragging one into unnecessary conflict, liberalism unapologetically embraces ideology as a way for powers to exhibit hegemony, you know, not just through raw power, but as G. John Eikenberry notes, through collective benefits of open trade, multilateralism, alliances, partnerships, democratic solidarity, human rights, and American hegemonic leadership. So this is a type of hegemony that Joseph Nye calls soft power, which is the ability of a country to persuade others to do what it wants without overt force or coercion. Usually this comes in the form of economic enticements, collective security, interdependence, or simply pop culture. And I think we can all agree that one of America's greatest international assets has been its ability to attract popularity by what it offers and what it can do with partnerships. But this presents a paradox of sorts, right? I mean, liberalism is definitely a far more progressive, optimistic and idealistic form of foreign policy than realism. Right? I don't think anybody is going to argue against that. Right? Its principal beliefs in the universal rights of man means that states can and should, and underline should, secure lasting peace and cooperative development through collective security and international interdependence. Now, these are the basic principles of Woodrow Wilson's international outlook that form the basis of modern liberalism. But at the same time, this arguably makes a liberal state much more belligerent, invasive, and, at least in the short run, dangerous to global stability by its very philosophical tenets because ideology compels a liberalist state to act wherever and whenever the universal rights of man are violated, suppressed, or just simply non-existent. So, you know, taken therefore to its logical conclusion, the belief in democratic peace theory, 
which is the belief that no two democracies go to war with each other, and the belief that the more democracies there are in the world, or at least a region, the more likely lasting peace will be achieved, and the less likely war will break out, all means that there is a high probability that liberalist powers will use coercive diplomacy to force non-democratic states to change their ways. You know, for all of its pessimism and initial sense of aggressiveness, realism doesn't really care what you are, right? A state is a state is a state. And in that way, realism may not be more peaceful, but it's actually less likely to start a war. Or as realism says, leave ideology at the doorstep. Liberalism wears ideology like a badge, right? Like a badge. And therefore, the ideology that espouses a belief in the universal rights of man means that liberalist states are compelled to intervene where those rights are violated. You know? I mean, think about this. You can't certainly expect to be taken seriously if you claim to uphold human rights but do nothing to defend them when they're violated someplace else. So this means that liberalist states will get involved a lot more in international affairs than others. And this also helps explain, you know, to a degree, why the United States intervened in Korea, in Vietnam, in a crumbling Yugoslavia, in Somalia, and in Iraq. This is why constructivism offers us such a handy way of understanding how state A can employ realism towards state B and liberalism towards state C through differing narratives, because states, as I said in the beginning, see each other as an ally, enemy, neutral, peaceful, belligerent, aggressive, terrorist, communist, fascist, democratic, you know, regardless of their actual government and ideology. And I think that it's no, you know, secret um, when we, you know, look at the world and note that the United States, for instance, engages with Europe, and especially Western Europe, as partners and, you know, even equals. And we look at Eastern Europe, on the other hand, not so much as partners, but more so as clients. We view the Middle East as hostile, exploitative, and in need of American-led leadership and stabilization. But, you know, even here, we'll push for regime change in enemy Iraq, belligerent Syria, or terrorist Iran before we ever put pressure on, you know, on our Saudi, Jordanian, or Kuwaiti allies to do so. And that's because within constructivism, foreign policy is based not just on power and security, nor on upholding universal rights, but on models of identity, image, and narrative that see a proliferation of universal rights as an extension of power and security, right? So by employing constructivism, we can understand how the promotion of Wilsonian ideals and principles can be connected to and even justify coercive methods of foreign policy. Now, we can either wait for states to eventually get it right and evolve into democracies, or we, as a you know, power guided by ideology to uphold and defend life, liberty, and democracy, can force a belligerent state to change its ways by, if necessary, changing its regime. Right? So once a state believes it has the clout and moral authority to intervene on behalf of the greater good, you know, all of a sudden it starts engaging whole parts of the world it would never interact with before. So yes, American foreign policy is shaped a lot by how America sees itself, the world, and itself in the world, you know, all of which contribute to a collection of narratives that promote a sense of American exceptionalism. So let me just take a quick detour for a moment and you know, explore this phenomenon because I really think this gets to the heart of how and why the United States interacts with the world the way it does, how it sees the, its role on the global stage, and how it views its perceived rivals and enemies. You know, much has been written on the subject, both in praise and in criticism, but without getting into too much detail and minutia. You know, ideas of American exceptionalism are still officially projected by the State Department, the Pentagon, the White House, Congress, and many mainstream media outlets. And I'm sure you've heard a lot of them before, right? One in particular, you know, America is the land of the free 
and the defender of liberty, right? And this has been an embedded part of our national psyche, I think, since Woodrow Wilson. It was reinforced by Franklin Roosevelt and has been institutionalized since Harry Truman. You know, in effect, in so many words, we're the good guys, right? We saved the day that others ruined. We may not start wars, but we certainly end them. And if we have to intervene in other countries, we don't occupy them, we liberate them. Because our soldiers aren't invaders, they're peacekeepers, right? The word choice here is important because the narrative that's used, or at least the one that's trying to be sold, portrays the United States as an upholder of universal laws and values that no one else is going to fight for. And whether you believe in it or not, this is the primary guiding ideology that mobilizes the United States to act, right? I think up to the present day. Now, along with this is an older narrative of America being a sort of city on the hill, to you know, borrow the original term from Jonathan Winthrop that's been repeatedly used over the past three centuries, right? most recently by Ronald Reagan and George Bush Sr. In a nutshell, the world looks to us for leadership and guidance, and it's our moral imperative to promote and defend democratic principles since we are its bastion. Right? its refuge, and its core. So with just two of these ideas in mind, and you know, there's a lot more that defines the narrative, one can see how it's kind of our moral imperative to not only promote, but also defend liberal democratic principles. If all we do is remain behind walls and closed doors, you know, that, that doesn't do anybody any good. But if we want to defend our prestige, we need to defend principles of liberalism around the world. And you know, let's think strategically here, right? Why wouldn't more countries want to become democratic? Right? Democratic countries are those where uncertainty, conflict, and security threats are significantly reduced, if not altogether eliminated, because democracies tend to be much more cooperative with each other. You know, they may not agree on everything, but their grievances never escalate into actual conflict. So if we take this logic one step further, we surmise that you know, if there are more democracies in the world, the less likely it will be for war to break out again. So a concluding hypothesis of American exceptionalism is that no other country on the planet has the resources to do this. You know, we have the money, we have the military wherewithal, we have the clout, we have the brand recognition, and most importantly, we have the willingness to do it where other countries either can't or won't. So the United States has this thankless task of being the world's policeman and voice of moral authority. And even if there are states that don't want this, or at least don't understand this, American exceptionalism argues that the eventual ends, which are always projected to be good ends, will justify the short-term costs and losses. But that in itself is a paradoxical problem. I mean, the most obvious problem is that we're clearly not everywhere we should be. We involve ourselves in places we shouldn't be, and we give a lot of states and governments that are in clear violation of these universal principles a free pass. I mean, look, we don't do this because we're philanthropic. We do it because it furthers our interests in strategic locations, and we invest the time, manpower, and diplomacy and resources because we want a capital return on our investment. And you know, this isn't particular to the United States, so I don't want you to think I'm singling this country out. Any great power is going to balance collective development with strategic engagement. I mean, take NATO, for instance, right? Uh, the, the United States envisions a multinational security alliance across Europe that will lock member states into some type of interdependent cooperative that reduces the likelihood that one country will go to war with another. But let's be honest, NATO is going to benefit the U.S. better than anyone else because NATO justifies American military presence in Europe and now the Middle East. The security facilitates cooperation and trust. And this is the thing, knowing we're safe makes us sleep with the windows open. Right? So you know, a question to ask is, does realism allow liberalism to spread? You know, does the presence of a pervasive security apparatus give one the leisure and luxury to be thinking of better things? Does having an army, a strong economy, and widespread diplomatic influence allow a state to be humanitarian? I mean, better yet, 
Does having power and authority give a state the ability to decide when to be humanitarian? I mean, I, I mean, it doesn't take much to realize that American intervention on humanitarian grounds is highly selective, and in many situations targets a state that's less abusive than some others it considers to be an ally. So why did we intervene in Somalia and not Rwanda? Why are we keen on stopping ethnic cleansing in Bosnia and not Sudan? Why do we care about changing borders in the Balkans and why do we force other people to live in countries they clearly don't want to live in in the Middle East? The short answer to all of this is because doing or not doing reflects America's interests, which is clearly a realist attribute. Now, we intervened in Bosnia and later Kosovo because the ethnic conflict was in Europe. We originally engaged Somalia, but pulled out shortly after the infamous Black Hawk Down incident because of memories of Vietnam and fears of getting bogged down in another third world insurgent war. Now, this already showed our limited commitment to Somalia, but also explains why we chose to completely ignore Rwanda, another peripheral middle-of-nowhere country in Africa, but one where genocide clearly took place. And speaking of Vietnam, the United States intervened under a rationale of domino theory that postulated if Vietnam fell to communism, so too would Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and the rest of Southeastern Asia. Now, we also intervened in Vietnam, most likely because we were still sore about losing Cuba to Castro the year before. You know, m more in the recent period, we support the independence of Kosovo because it allows us to gain a strategic foothold in the Balkans. But we're against self-determination of Kurds and the formation of a Kurdish state because it goes against our partnership with Turkey and Iraq. We justify violating Serbia's sovereignty on humanitarian necessity, but uphold the territorial integrity of Georgia and Ukraine, despite separatist movements unilaterally declaring independence there too. Right? We say Kosovo is a special case simply because it suits our interests, not because there's anything unique backed up by international law. Right? So thus, Wilsonian realism is a type of coercive diplomacy used to spread American ideals and American interests. Now, more to the point, the realism part of Wilsonian realism is the understanding that you know, you're not going to get universal human rights, democracy, and interdependence by you know, asking nicely. You, know, you can't expect states to do what you want them to do, and you certainly can't wait for them to finally come around to it. Thus, Wilsonian realism believes that the greater good sometimes needs, well, a little coercive kickstart with a right amount of pressure to orient states towards cooperation and harmony. Now, this coerciveness consists of three general things. The primary goal is to facilitate friendly and cooperative regimes. Notice I didn't say democratic. They might be democratic, and if they are, well, that's just bonus points. But friendly and cooperative governments don't have to necessarily be democratic. And a good example of this was America's support for South Vietnam in the 1960s and 70s against the Communist North. The government in Saigon was basically democratic in name only, was widely despised, overwhelmingly corrupt, and despicably authoritarian. But because the government was anti-communist and was an ally of Washington, the United States lent its support. Right. Number two is the spreading of free market capitalism, which might even be more important than facilitating friendly and cooperative regimes, because the belief is that free market capitalism will get us friendly and cooperative regimes. Right. And third, forming alliances against enemies, both political and ideological. Now, looking at the third, one might give us a better understanding of the first, forming alliances against enemies. Now, well, who are the enemies? The enemies are those we perceive to be obstacles to our interests and objectives. Right? Russia and Iran are our enemies over Syria because of their support for the Assad regime. Cuba is our enemy because of the communist movement that overthrew the Batista government despite its unpopularity. Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Cong were our enemy not just because they posed a threat to U.S. security, but because they challenged U.S. interests in Vietnam. It's also worth asking if Wilsonian realism is really nothing more than democracy at gunpoint. You know, this understanding that the more democracies there are in the world, the greater the likelihood there will be for peace, means the greater the likelihood the United States will support it. But here's the question.
Are some states ready for democracy? Are some states compatible with democracy? Now, now I'm not questioning the culture's compatibility so much as I'm questioning whether the political conditions are compatible for democracy. You know, the biggest problem in promoting democracy in another state is that they might actually do something with it. And, you know, when the public is finally given an opportunity to voice its own opinions, their collective opinions at the poll may be something you, the facilitator of democracy, don't want. Which, of course, puts the U.S. in a number of awkward situations. You know, in one scenario, you can push for democratic elections and actually get a government that doesn't believe relying on American support and promoting American interests is the best thing for their country and people and may actually be a retardant on democratic rights and freedoms. So if you're the U.S., you want to make sure the government that gets elected is one you can do business with and one that will allow you to stick around indefinitely. And, of course, the state in question can also elect a government that's inherently illiberal or even non-democratic. You know, the old Weimar scenario of Hitler and National Socialism coming to power via free and fair elections. Right? Worse, you could even get a government that truly believes in promoting and upholding political rights and civil liberties only to tell the U.S. or Great Britain or France or whoever, you know, thanks, we've got it from here, go home. So then, you know, are you going to say, yeah, great, cool, fine, wow, <laughs> what a wasted opportunity? Or are you going to try to convince them they still need your presence? You know, of course, there's times when we don't even have to react to an elected government we don't like. Because there's a chance the state's military will intervene and overthrow the government for different reasons than what we'd want. But at the same time, hey, we're happy to see them go. I mean, you know, look no further than Egypt where the democratically elected yet short-lived government of the Muslim Brotherhood, which was not something the United States was hoping to get, was nevertheless overthrown in a military-led coup by General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Now, are we sad that democracy was thwarted in Egypt? You know, maybe, but at the same time, we're happy. We've got another leader in Cairo who will take our money in return for promoting our interests. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time this happened in Egypt, and sadly, it won't be the last. So we have to understand that as far as American foreign policy goes, is that as a procedure, democracy, at least theoretically, the voice of the people should be recognized. But developing democracies are still very volatile, and the likelihood of a fringe extremist movement somehow riding the waves of early electoral practice and getting into power is still probable. And so oftentimes there's this understanding from the U.S. that you know, democracy might not be the right thing for the people at this time. So if you're going to say you support democracy around the world, but then intervene in elections when you don't like the result, how do you reconcile this? I mean, this is the way in which liberalist ideology is balanced out, if not filtered, through realist self-interest. And speaking of self-interest, you know, if you're a powerful state <clears throat> operating under the rhetorical foreign policy of liberalism, but have the ability to influence events, you can always exert enough pressure to get the government that you want. Right? I mean, again, we can't always wait for things to naturally happen. So if you can, you know, control tilde cheat code your way to a solution, you're going to take that road. Right? And we can force people out of power. We can instigate a little uprising, or if we really don't have time for that, you know, we can use the CIA to orchestrate some coup that overthrows a relatively unpopular leader in the name of democracy, freedom, liberty, etc. Mind you, this is the narrative that America is using, not the country in question. You know, kind of like what we're trying to do to help out the poor people in Venezuela, you know, languishing under the oppressive socialist government of Nicolas Maduro. Now, you know, we may not know much about the internal dynamics of Venezuela, uh, but we know enough to know that Venezuela and socialism are two buzzwords that scream American intervention for whatever good reason the Trump administration and the mainstream media are pitching us. And, you know, Maduro may not be popular in Venezuela, but replacing him with Guaido may not necessarily be the best thing for Venezuela, but it's the best thing for the United States. So Wilsonian realism holds an underlying assumption that civil liberties can only really be enjoyed after national security is assured. You know, we build that wall, we equip our army, we fortify our defenses, 
you know, we get right what needs to be gotten right, and, and then we can spend hour after hour you know, doing each other's hair and talking about the democratic rights of man. But until that time, safer worlds need to be acquired through superior firepower. Wilsonian realism holds the belief that without an external security apparatus performing the critical functions of protecting and preserving everything inside, there's absolutely no point in investing in anything that provides mutual gain. Realism offers the walls of a gated community. And within those walls, you have the luxury and safety of engaging in economic cooperation and promoting the democratic rights of man. Right? Absent those walls and civil liberties default once again to national security. Right? It's a truth realists believe liberalists just can't handle. So the point is this. The promised land of liberalism is clearly enticing. State-to-state right? -state interdependency through economic and political links, collective security through mutual cooperation, a reduction in uncertainty and misinformation virtually eliminating the prospects of war, and working with some of the most advanced industrial states in the world would be enough of a light at the end of a tunnel for any state to want to head towards. But to get to that promised land, you have a lot of obstacles to overcome, battles to fight, and transitions to make. And more often than not, the road to democracy is paved with instability and possibly even war. The morals and values liberalism professes pressure states to change the internal dynamics of their government. And this is a highly invasive procedure that puts states at the mercy of what they can only hope are the good intentions of the hegemonic powers. I mean, look, if you're a major state in the region, if you want to make an omelet, you're going to have to break a few eggs. And yes, in order to get to the promised land of liberalism, sometimes a state has to undergo regime change in order to start the process. This is what was believed in the early 2000s by the neoconservatives of the George W. Bush administration, which argued that regime change in Iraq would not only start the process of that country's democratic transition, but would produce a domino effect throughout the Middle East that would put pressure on other authoritarian regimes in Syria, Kuwait, Jordan, and eventually Iran to liberalize as well. But the key here is the United States would be in the driver's seat, seeing this transition carried out in its image and in its interests, while also making sure the waves of democracy don't disrupt states we want stable, like Saudi Arabia. Now, we don't want to wait for the social revolution to come to your country. So Wilsonian realism believes that if we can do this now and speed things up in the right places, then the sooner we'll get to perpetual peace. So while liberalism itself may not necessarily be coercive, it employs ideology that compels states to engage the world. Right? The Wilsonian variant of liberalism is inherently internationalist and seeks to engage the world for some you know, idealistic greater good. But the road to achieve these ends is by itself quite unclear. So it's through constructivism that we get our breakthrough as it couples the idealistic zeal of liberalism with the preservatory self-interest of realism to produce this hybrid form of Wilsonian realism that is definitely coercive, definitely aggressive, and definitely belligerent towards states perceived to be antagonistic to universal values of human rights and political freedoms. It turns the preservatory character of realism into a predatory strategy of justifying offense as a larger defense. It gives states like the U.S. justification for intervening in the Middle East, Latin America, the Balkans, and East Asia, all in the name of upholding some lofty principles and ideals, but at the same time using those principles as a way of entrenching American interests and leverage to counter others. So if coercive diplomacy can get states to do something with either the promise of giving or threat of withholding money, then Wilsonian realism is a form of coercive diplomacy that wields power through means other than the military. Right? You want to be part of the American international system of alliances? You want to be part of the EU? You want investment from American, British, German, or French firms? Well, you're going to have to do a couple of things that make the established states see you as one of their own. Knowing full well that going it alone risks isolation and a number of unforeseen consequences. And if compellence destabilizes politics and society in the short run, well, that's just the price you need to take.
So this is why Wilsonian realism is potentially the most belligerent form of foreign policy in the world today. You know, if anything, Wilsonian realism holds the belief that sometimes it's actually better to fight and overthrow an intractable government, pick up the pieces afterwards, and cooperate with a more compliant group of people. Thus, liberal ideological philosophies function as the self-interest and strategic interest of the power that's pulling the strings. Now, this not only explains how constructivism helps us understand why states go to war, but also how liberalist states justify it for ideologically noble and moral reasons. So what do you think about Wilsonian realism? Is it as belligerent as I've said? Do you feel that it best reflects the foreign policy of the United States? Comment below and offer your thoughts. If you like the content of this page and haven't done so already, please subscribe and click the notification button to stay on top of new videos being released you know, every week or so. And if you have any ideas or topics you'd like me to cover in the next video, please comment below as well as with your ideas. And if it's within my capacity to talk about it, I will. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.